Good afternoon, everybody. How are you all doing? <laughs> Left hand side, how are you doing? Right hand side? You're not going to let them do that, are you, left hand side? Come on! Right, excellent. It's all uphill from here. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the big session on the big book of dashboards. My name is Andy Cockgreave, but first let me introduce my two esteemed colleagues. On my left, oh, I haven't got my slide. Look at that, like a pro, I haven't got my slides lined up. Who let this amateur in? <laughs> Here we go. It's not working. That worked a second ago. All right, there we go. Right, sorry, there we go. I've been doing presentations for 10 years. That's incredible. All right, first of all, some housekeeping before we get started. Please raise your hands if you have the app. All right, that means every single one of you can do a review. Please fill out the feedback uh, for this and all the sessions. It's really important that we know what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong with this presentation. Uh, it helps us get it uh, better and better each time. And that applies to all the sessions. So fill out the session to tell us what we need to improve and use Twitter to tell, tell everybody what was brilliant. OK, is that a deal? Good. Uh, second bit of housekeeping is if you want to purchase the book or get a copy of the book signed, Steve and Jeff are going to be here afterwards. Unfortunately, I have to run to another session. But we are doing a book signing tomorrow at 10.30 in the bookstore. Uh, so come and have a look at that. OK, with housekeeping over, let's talk a little bit about the book. Um, myself, Jeff, and Steve have well over 30 years of experience in data visualization and doing business intelligence and dashboarding. You clearly wouldn't expect that from our fresh young faces, but it is true, 30 years of experience. Over the last 18 months, we condensed that into a 400-page book. And today, we're going to attempt to condense that into a 45 or 50-minute 50 50 minute presentation. Sound good? All right. Now, before we start, I'm, just, I'm interested. Who has purchased a copy of the book? All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, everybody else, go and speak to the people who just raised their hands and get a genuine review. I'm going to show you my favorite review. Uh, as a father, uh, it is my job to inspire my children. This is my seven-year-old daughter Lucy's review of the book. This is my dad's book, and I think it's really boring because it's about dashboards. <laughs> God damn it. But the good news is she drew that picture while we were on holiday. She didn't copy it. It went, came from her memory. So I think she did a pretty good job. So uh, hopefully you enjoy the book more than my daughter Lucy does. But hello, Lucy, wherever you are. Now, let me introduce my two esteemed authors. Um, as somebody who's been at Tableau for many years, it's been an honor for me to manage the Zen Master program. And being able to write a book with two esteemed Tableau Zen Masters was a great opportunity. Steve asked me to uh, come join the project about, uh, when was it? Two years ago. Two years ago. Uh, yeah, behind stage in Las yes. Vegas. Uh, so Steve Wexler is the founder of Data Revelations, a once one Tableau Iron Viz. I mean, awesome, man. Yeah. Uh, and is also a Tableau Zen master. And if you want to do anything with survey data, Steve's the man. He's also a mean bass player, right? He runs a band in New York. My other colleague is Jeff Schaefer, uh, vice president of what is like, what's your company? At Unifund, that's it. Uh, and also a professor, teaches students about this stuff, and is also a Tableau Zen master uh, and a mean trumpeter. So this is pretty cool. These are two talented gentlemen. Myself, I'm Andy Cotgreave. I've been with Tableau uh, nearly six years, uh, but I started using Tableau almost 10 years ago, 10 years ago next month, in fact. Uh, and I'm evangelist at Tableau, write columns. And I'm a magician, so if you want to see some magic tricks at any time you see me this week, just come and ask me. I'll show you some stuff. So that is us. And today, we are going to talk, tell you uh, six lessons that we have sort of taken from the book and think we can share with you today. So we're just going to do a few of those. Are you ready to get started? Excellent. Yes, from over there. That's, I love it. So first up is Jeff. 
to start at the basics. Jeff, over to you. So we have a book entitled The Big Book of Dashboards. We figured what's the place to start is what is a dashboard? We started with these long definitions of what a dashboard is, and over a period of months, uh, all the way even until we were editing the book, we were editing this definition of what a dashboard is. Now, if you go and look at other materials, you may have seen this definition. This is Stephen Few's definition that is in his book, Information Dashboard Design, and he calls it a visual display, if that makes sense, of the most important information to achieve one or more objectives. So far, so good. And then it's consolidated or arranged on a single screen. We weren't sure whether we agreed with that, whether it had to be on a single screen, and monitored at a glance. We really didn't like that because we thought, well, does the dashboard really have to be monitored at a glance? Now, there is another definition that Steve has out there. It's called a faceted analytical display. This comes from about 10 years ago, and it's somewhat similar, interactive charts and graphs and tables that reside on a single screen again, which present a different view of a common data set used to analyze information. Now, Steve reviewed our book. He had some very kind things to say about them, but one thing he said uh, about the dashboards in our book is that he didn't really consider them dashboards. Uh, there were only about two uh, that you'll see, um, and so he really thinks that they're probably more a faceted analytical display. So I guess technically we're happy to stick around and sign your copy of the big book of faceted analytical displays. Um, rolls right off the tongue, right? Uh, <clears throat> I think at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what the necessarily the definition is. Our definition was really focused on those two areas of arranged on a single screen and monitored at a glance. We really dropped that and just made it very simple. A visual display of data used to monitor conditions and or facilitate understanding. So pretty simple. Now it's a broad definition. That could be data visualization in general and we, we realized that. Um, so as I said, of our book, um, you know, Two, I guess, out of our 28 dashboards, you know, might might be considered by Steve. Wanted to open up uh, with you today uh, about another book called *Steal Like an Artist*. It's a really thin book. You can read it in one setting. Wonderful read. I'd highly encourage you to pick it up. Nobody is born with a style or voice. We don't come out of the womb knowing who we are. In the beginning, we learn by pretending to be our heroes. We learn by copying. We're talking about practice here, not plagiarism. Plagiarism is trying to pass someone else's work off as your own. Copying is about reverse engineering. It's like a mechanic taking apart a car to see how it works. We learn to write by copying down the alphabet. Musicians learn to play by practicing scales. Painters learn to paint by reproducing masterpieces. Copy your heroes, the people you love, the people you're inspired by, the people you want to be. The reason to copy your heroes is their style is so that you might somehow get a glimpse into their minds. That's what it's really want. You want to internalize the way of looking at the world. And at the heart, I think that's why we wrote the big book of dashboards. When we look at the other body of knowledge, there were a lot of books out there showing examples after examples of what not to do. And we really tried to find things that work, and those are the things that we're going to talk about with you today, some things that we learned along the way. Uh, but we encourage you, it's one of the things I love about Tableau Public. Go on Tableau Public and find something that you like, and then go figure out how they did it. We want you to use the book in the same way. Find a scenario or a dashboard that you like and pull a piece. Pull this piece from there or another piece from another dashboard. And so with that, I'd like to get to our first tip of today, which is design to a grid. Now this comes from the field of graphic design. Graphic designers are trained to design to a grid. And it might be, here's text, simple text, that is in a row with four columns. And this grid, you can show this grid in Adobe Illustrator. It's, you just check a box and you can kind of show and design to a grid. We saw the Tableau 10.5 demo. Woo! We're gonna be able to do that, right? Design right to a grid, very easy. Well, it doesn't always have to be a grid like this either. Here's text. This is also designed to a grid. It may not look like it because it's going at an angle, but it is. It's designed exactly the same way as the other one. We can use the same concept on our dashboards. We want to design our dashboards to a grid. This is one from Tableau Public by Rob Radburn, and this is one a Makeover Monday set. And this is designed to a grid. If you look at it, it's, it's just rows and columns of data. <clears throat> this one here is the CTT wireless dashboard from the book. This is clearly 
in a grid design where we have three goals right down with three rows and then an executive summary on the right hand side. Your goal one, reduce subscriber acquisition cost and you read right across that row for that goal. The second goal, increase average return per user. We've identified the goal and you can read right across the grid. The third, reduce churn. There's even a scenario in the book about churn. And so there, there's the goal, reducing churn. And then the executive summary over on the right-hand side. Here's another example. This one's by Jonathan Drummy, one of the Tableau Zen masters. He did this for Southern Maine Healthcare. And it's a doctor, uh, a provider productivity ranking. And in the bottom, in the very bottom left-hand corner, you'll see a drop-down box. Whoever the doctor is can pick themselves in the list and can see how they're doing. And it's clearly designed to a grid, in this case, just two simple columns, three rows. This dashboard here I like because this is meant to be on a large screen display in a call center. And so think about a large TV in a call center. If you're working in that call center and you need to look up at this large screen, things need to be in the same place. You need to be able to find them quickly. And so again, three rows, four columns, even the lines are designed in this to a grid. Very simple and easy to see. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Jeff. So I'm Steve Wexler, and Andy mentioned I am one of the Tableau Zen Masters. Most people don't know that a Zen Master, a Tableau Zen Master, is an actual thing. And when you hand somebody a business card and it says Tableau Zen Master, and they don't know that, they look at the card and go, man, this guy must be a total tool. <laughs> You know, who puts Zen Master on their own card? Jeez, God, this guy must be full of himself, which it is kind of the case. No, it's a wonderful name, and I'm very proud to be it, but I realized someone once said, is this an actual thing? And I said, oh, yeah, it is. So, okay, so what I'm going to be speaking about is avoiding clutter. You will see why later I am, um, in fact, very qualified to discuss clutter. I want to show you a visualization very similar to one that I saw presented at a Tableau user group. I've, I've exaggerated only slightly, but someone actually got up and they showed this. Okay, this is an example of clutter. There are lots of things that can conspire to make your chart hard to read. In this case, the biggest uh, in, in fraction is the use of color, and Jeff is going to be speaking about that in a moment. The other thing is that all the labels that are on there. It is also an example of what we call, and, and we hope this works, and you may want to watch your ears. Oh, didn't work. It makes an incredibly loud, annoying noise. Everyone would have been, you know, how if you were sleeping, it would have gone off completely. In any case, this is an example of a screaming cat that we wanted to have make clear in the book things we didn't want you to do. I've read lots of data visualization books, and I'll be thumbing through them, and I'll come across a dashboard or a data visualization, and I wonder, wait, am I supposed to make this? Or is this something I'm supposed to avoid? We didn't want to have any ambiguity. We wanted to make sure that we wanted something that said, don't make this, and that's our icon. And in fact, we have a bunch of stickers and buttons. If you'd like a screaming cat a sticker or button, you're welcome to have one. In any case, if we go back you know, to this thing here, Imagine you are passionate, you are responsible for copiers and faxes, and you want to know how it is doing compared with all the other products that are there. You can't find that. That's why you, this thing should get a screaming cat. Just imagine that annoying sound. Instead, reduce all the stuff that's competing for your attention and just focus what's unimportant to the user. So one line that's in color, everything, all the labels are gone, and I can now see instantly, hey, my product that was really doing poorly early on is doing great now. It's the fourth best, and I couldn't see that before. So let's talk about things that you can do to reduce the clutter. One is the use of white space, aka negative space. Those of you who are steeped in design or studied desktop publishing, we're going to borrow from that where if you just schmutz everything close together, it's very hard to take in. Problems with line spacing and leading here. So you apply a little more space. You don't have to cram everything into every empty space. It becomes a much easier thing to read. So I'm going to show you two types of examples where the problem is either how the items are arranged on the screen or that you have too many items. 
So let me show you an early cut of a dashboard that is in Jeff's firm, Unifund, to try to show uh, customer complaints. And there are a lot of things about this that are conspiring to make it hard to read. The chief infraction with this, and the reason that this thing is in fact going to earn a screaming cat if it were to appear in the book, is that you've got, um, there are roughly four different elements, but they're packed together. There's no breathing room. It's not clear where one starts, where the other one le leaves off. You've got borders, you've got rules, you've got numbers on every single bar. It's just too hard to take in. Let me show you what made it into the book. And it's still, again, roughly just four elements. Much easier to breathe, much easier to take in. You can see the four things. I don't have everything labeled. I don't have unnecessary borders and rules and labels and so forth. Um, and here we can contrast it. Here's the before version, and here's the after version. But again, roughly just four elements. Now, let me show you what we refer to as the kitchen sink dashboard. And this is an early cut of a dashboard, and everyone who submitted a dashboard went through it an iterative process where, where we kind of wanted to hone stuff. This is from Co Enterprise. They do terrific work, and it is a workers' compensational, uh, workers' compensation dashboard. And there's just so much stuff on this dashboard. And, and all of it is important, I understand that. But the chief thing that's making this thing so hard to parse is it's just too many things to take in. In addition to that, everything has numbers on it and labels and, 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 and unnecessary rules. So in this case was, does all this stuff have to be on this dashboard? So instead, and so it would earn a, a, a screaming cat, there's just too much stuff on it. Here's the version of it that made it into the book. Much simpler, this is probably right on the threshold of what you can and can't take in in terms of number of different elements, but it, it's a, a, it breathes, it's easy to see the different elements, and just to compare and contrast uh, the different, uh, the before version of the dashboard and the after version, and we're gonna talk about collaborating and iteration in a little bit. Also, I started this off by saying that, hey, I wanna explain to you why I am uniquely qualified. Well, not uniquely qualified to talk about clutter. There are thousands of people at this conference that could talk about clutter. But let me, let me show you an example of my work from about 10 years ago, um, before there was even a Tableau conference. This is from 2007. Remember, I started my life by visualizing survey data, and it's, I wanted to show uh, the popularity of various learning modalities in the USA and Canada versus uh, internationally. Okay, um, if you have young children, you may want to cover their eyes. That's really, really bad on so many levels. And everything I was trying to do to make it clearer made it harder to understand. So this definitely gets a screaming cat. Um, I'd make the cat even bigger. The, um, the rules that are in there, the, the gray shading, the yellow shading, the, the, the do I really need to have two levels of percentages? I don't see how anyone could take this in. So there's so much that's wrong with, the char with this visualization. And what's making it hardest to see is all the clutter. Turns out this isn't even the best chart to use for this. If I were doing this now, this is the chart that I would do, which is it's either called a gap chart, a um, connected dot plot, or a dumbbell chart. And um, uh, Jeff talked about stealing like an artist. I stole from one of the dashboards that he made, the, um, the course metrics dashboard, to show this. But the, the, the chief thing about it is it's so much easier to take this in. With that, I'm going to pass things back over to Jeff, and he's going to talk about uh, the chief infraction in data visualization. Jeff? Yes, if I had to pick one thing in data visualization that people get wrong the most, it would be color, the use of color. And I don't think we use color, I don't think it's on purpose. I don't think people go into the visualization and say, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna use color really poorly and mess this up, right? It's not, it's not like we try to do that. We go in with good intentions of organizing our data uh, with colors and, and you know, maybe many categorical comparisons and we do that. But unfortunately, most of our efforts look more like this. And uh, so what I would drive you to is probably my, the most, my favorite page in the book, page 15, the use of color in data visualization, because this is what I beat into my students at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, there are three primary ways that you're gonna use color, and those are at the top, sequential, 
diverging, and categorical. And those are the three major ways that we're going to encode color into data viz. And then there are two others we listed at the bottom. They're really categorical comparisons, um, but there's just two colors in those examples. So how do we use this with our data? And this is one of the things I love about Tableau, by the way, because this is built into the Tableau engine. They have the, the best practices for color are built in depending on the pills that you drag over onto your canvas. So let's talk about these color types. Let's look at sequential color. A sequential color scheme is a single color going from light to dark. So think, in this case, uh, the blue at the top or the, the orange on the map. It's going from uh, zero, maybe, to infinity. Sales is a great example of this. Everybody has zero sales going to infinity. In this particular map, you have the unemployment rate of the states going from low to high. This is a quantitative variable. In Tableau, when you move a green pill, right, a, a something that's continuous, um, that, that quantitative measure, it's going to use a sequential color scheme. Great. All right, well, then you have diverging. Diverging is also a quantitative color scheme, but there's a little difference in this one. There's a natural midpoint with two colors meeting in the middle. And this example could be profit by state, which is what you're seeing on the map. Profit doesn't start at zero, right? We could be losing money in our company or we could be making money in our company. So there's numbers below zero and there's numbers above zero. But the midpoint doesn't always have to be zero. The midpoint could be the target. What's our target? Are we below target or are we above target? It could be an average. What's the average unemployment rate in the country? And we're below average in these states and we're above average in those states. So the midpoint could really be any number of things, but the key is that this is also a quantitative comparison and it's going into the center to a natural midpoint. Then we have categorical data. And we do this a lot. This is, this is probably the simplest use of color, right? Categories. So in, in apparel, it might be shoes and socks and shirts and, uh, and ties. In uh, automobiles, it might be cars and minivans and motorcycles and so on. This is where I think people start mixing up color because sometimes you'll see people using, oh, maybe the sequential color scheme. Um, let me go back here. And imagine that you're looking at the sequential color scheme, the blue at the top. Let's, let's just look at the top line blue. And I say cars are the third blue and motorcycles are the fourth blue. How are you, the one that's just a little bit darker than the other blue, right? That'd be really, really hard to do. And, or think about it the other way. I go to this categorical color and I say here, well, orange is more than blue or brown is more than blue. That's going to be really hard for us to think of more or less. So this in Tableau would be a blue pill, right? Something that is a dimension that is going to be in a discrete manner. So it, uh, any kind of um, uh, slicing or dicing of your data. Now, I mentioned two others. Highlight is one. Highlight is where we want to draw attention to the reader. You already saw an example of this. Steve did it in the uh, line chart with copiers and faxes. So we want to focus on the data that's the most important, copies and faxes. In this case, we want to focus on Washington, our state. So this could be a, something that a, a salesperson clicks on, maybe a drop-down filter or something, but it highlights the story that we want to talk about. And then a variation on highlight is alert alerting the reader to something that is, needs attention. This is like, think bad, right? Alarm bells. And to do this, we're going to use a bright, alerting color. In Western culture, that's most likely red. So in business, we always tend to think red is bad. And so in Western, uh, that, that would be bad. You will have to think about that in, in China. Red's not bad. Red is good. So uh, you'd have to think about the culture for that. But what it does here is it grabs your attention. You know that 19 days is too long, and we should go look at that. Now I know where to look for my problem. All right, here are some examples of color in practice. This is from Nicholas Felton's Feltron report. He did a 10-year quantified self project, and I have a couple examples here. In this example, he's just using a highlight color. He's just highlighting certain features of the visualization. Very simple use of color. There's a gray, there's a yellow. Very simple. This was inspiration for me for my website analytics dashboard that's featured in the book. That yellow could actually be anything. It could be any color. In, in the book, we actually do a black and white example of that to show that color is not actually even a variable in this, in this visualization. Here's another example where Nicholas Felton's just using a black and a blue, two colors. You'll see a lot of examples in our book of where there's just two or three colors in, in the dashboard. We don't want to confuse people with too many colors. 
So that is an example of what we used in the course metrics dashboard. Blue represents the last two most recent rating periods. You can rate it in the past and you teach it right now. So as you're teaching, you're, you can see the ratings for the past classes. And that blue is consistent throughout the visualization to show those rating periods. We have this one. This was done by Matt Chambers. This is a what if analysis, the impact of minimum wage at a company. Blue below minimum wage, gray above minimum wage, a very simple use of color. All right, the other thing I want to talk to you with related to color is color vision, vision deficiency, CVD. And color vision deficiency is, is uh, commonly referred to as color blindness. And in this case, um, in this large room for sure, there, there, there's definitely somebody in here who's colorblind. The numbers would just be improbable. Um, but it, it's about 10% of men who are colorblind. Uh, in the studies, it's officially like 8% worldwide, and you'll hear 10% because in white culture, um, like in the United States where it's more uh, white males, it's even as high as 10, 11, even 12%. So uh, it's, it's a male problem, like many things in life, I guess. Um, so women, uh, it's, it's less than a percent, like a half a percent. So this, this becomes really important uh, when we're, we're designing. If anybody would like to, you know, I don't want to break HIPAA compliance here, but if anybody would like to raise their hand, anybody colorblind in here? Let's see, one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so come see me after the show. We're going to, you know, we're going to do a, uh, we'll do some studies on our colorblind pages and make sure they work for you. So here's the most common problem is that we hear all the time is red and green in data visualization. Don't use red and green. And the reason is that in colorblindness, CVD, the most common problems are of red and green in nature. They're even referred to as color red, red weak and green weak. And so on the, the left-hand side of this, you will see that there is something really, really bad going on. That's, that's the dark red that's really bad compared to the dark green, which is really good. And over here, you can try to make that comparison. It's a lot harder to see the really bad versus the really good. That's a primary problem. And this is a real report in my company, by the way. So this, this was from many, many years ago. I had a chief operating officer for five years of my life. Everything had to be red, yellow, and green. That's just every, all of our reports and dashboards were red, yellow, and green. So that would get a screaming cat, not for the poor design, but for the color choice because it's not accessible to a lot of people. What I want to go further, though, is that it's not just red and green. And we talk about the, this in the book. It's, it really should, the, the quote should probably be, do not use red, green, orange, and brown together because they will all look about the same. So there's no red on this. This is, this is orange, green, and brown. And simulating it on the right, you'd have a very, very hard time telling one dot from the next. So that would get a screaming cat. And then this one, I'm not using red and green at all. There's red in there, right, in, the, in that fuchsia color, uh, and the purple, right, it, it's mixed of colors, but simulating that on the right-hand side, that would be very difficult as well. So what do we offer for this? Um, what I, what I, we came up with in the book is to take this standard traffic light color palette, this is your standard red, yellow, and green. All business intelligence tools have this. Tableau has a stoplight color palette. If you simulate it, you'll see the problem, right? The brown on the one side over here looks a lot like the color that's over here. It's just really, really hard to tell the difference. So one thing you can do is make the red really, really dark, make the green really, really light, and by creating a contrast there, it'll be helpful for somebody who has CVD. They can tell the difference between the bottom box on the left and the bottom box on the right, just from light to dark. Another trick, if you can get away with it, is to put a little blue, because blue is your friend if, you're, if, you're, if you have color vision deficiency. Mix some blue into that green and give it like a bluish green, and when you do that, you'll create even more contrast on those colors, and you'll see the really, really dark on the right and almost a gray light on uh, uh, the gray on the, on the right and the dark color on the left. So there's the helpful tips. The, these palettes are available. Uh, the eight, the uh, hex codes for the color are up top on the slides there. And um, these palettes are, I think it's chapter 33 in the, in the book, Real World Color. This is uh, an example of how it would be used in practice. I mean, if this were a standard stoplight color, you wouldn't be able to tell the top bar from the bottom. So it wouldn't get any worse than that. Using our palette, you could tell the difference between the bottom being really dark and the top in light. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andy. Thank you very much, Jeff. 
I'm going to talk about fonts and bands. Does anybody know what a band is yet? Some of you maybe. Yeah. All right, we good. Right, we'll come on to that in a moment. First of all, who gives a font? Um, one of the things we find people do a lot, including me when I began using Tableau and doing data visualization, is getting carried away with fonts. You put a title, then a subtitle, then an axis, and then you just end up with a bit of a sort of a font mess, which just makes it harder for people to use it. It increases the cognitive load on your end users. So we recommend a three-level font scheme. Top, mid, and low-level font, as you can see this one from the complaints dashboard. Uh, there's also a highlight data, which is essentially the low-level font, but we just uh, invert the color there. Now, what you can also see in the way we've used the font here, we've kept them very simple. There are just a few point sizes, but also we've used blue to highlight. Uh, but we didn't highlight the, big, the biggest font, we highlighted the middle one, because that was the one we wanted people's attention to be drawn to. So what you see here, and what you see in really all the dashboards we've included, and all the dash good dashboards we see that you guys produce day in, day out, are ones which keep fonts simple. Uh, just don't get carried away, because the more you introduce onto the dashboard, the greater the cognitive load of the people trying to consume that information. Now, the other thing we've discovered, and we really thought long and hard, and as we went through the book, we evolved our, our thinking on something, uh, is what we call the bands, uh, the big angry numbers. Um, and the bands, this has been really important. Uh, there's something we've just, I think we've sort of been on a bit of a journey with bands, and as I'll show, you know, even Tableau, we're going on a journey uh, to actually uh, prove something about this. They're big, angry numbers, bands, big-ass numbers, whatever. We, we'll just call them bands from now on. Here is uh, one of Steve's dashboards, uh, not quite as it appears in the book. It shows um, uh, an agency utilization. Imagine you're, uh, you've got consultants and you want to hire them out to your end user, or hire them out to your clients. You want to do that efficiently. Now, this is an awesome dashboard. Uh, Steve, who wrote, did you work on this with? Creative Performance Their dashboard, I just helped a yeah, little. Yeah, Creative Performance Inc. Uh, did this dashboard, and uh, Steve just did some help on it. Uh, now, this is a great dashboard. This seems to have all those things we think would generally be a recommendation of dashboards. And certainly, I would have been happy to build this a few years ago. But it appeared in the book like this. Uh, in fact, I'll tell you a little bit more about the story of this dashboard later. But this has the bands on it, the big numbers. Uh, and they form, as we've discovered, as we've evolved our ideas around this, headlines. Now, single norm, on its own, that single number means nothing. It's just a number. There's no context. But it creates a headline for your metrics, which you can then go and get details from, from the visualization. People like to know what is the key number on this dashboard. We also find that bands are a great way to replace a color legend. So as you can see in this one, the second one on the left is green. That's, uh, what that's showing is potentially build hours that you could have done uh, with your clients in your agency. Uh, and because that's green and labeled as potential underneath, you no longer need to have a color legend showing what green is throughout the dashboard. We saw the complaints dashboard earlier, and here's another example. What you can see is uh, open here is open complaints, that kind of salmon, pink, red, maybe whatever color we call it. That's the only place on the dashboard that that color is explained. But because it's labeled here, right where you'll read it, you don't need a color legend anywhere else on the dashboard because the ban gives you that information. So bans are a great way to reveal headlines, uh, but also uh, reduce the amount of objects you need to put on a dashboard. This slide was intentionally left blank. Now, one of the awesome things I get to do at this company, at Tableau, I've been here for a long time, and it's just a wonderful company to work with, is that I get to work with our incredible research team. And some of you may have been to and seen some of the eye tracking research that we've been doing for the last year. Has anybody seen some of this? Has anybody done the studies? Wow, you're all awesome. Everybody else, you have a chance this week to help Tableau's research team. Let me explain how. We did some eye tracking research, uh, or my colleague Amy, who's in the research team, a very talented researcher, 
has been using eye tracking for the last year to answer, ask and answer many questions about how people consume dashboards. And one of the studies we did, or she led, was do bands at the top work better than bands at the bottom? And let me show you the results. What we're seeing here is one of the ways you can show results from eye tracking. This is called an opacity map, and it reveals uh, where people look as maybe you have 30 or 40 people looking at this dashboard. And what you can see is that the bands at the top are much more visually attractive. The ones on the right, people looked at them, but they didn't, took them a long time to get there, and they didn't spend much attention on it. So we think bands are very important, uh, and you put them at the top. It's a great way to put in a headline on your dashboard. The study we did was to look at, well, should you make them big or small? So on the left is how the dashboard appears in the book. And you can see the bands are there, but they're kind of teeny. And on the right, the bands are there, but they're much bigger. How did that work in the experiment? Well, the first thing you see is that people like to look at potentially naked things on the right, right? <laughs> Fair enough. That, I don't recommend you put potentially naked figures on your dashboards until you have a reason. This one does, fortunately. But look at the bands in the middle. They had a longer, uh, oops, a long, oops, a longer dwell time. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a highlight on that. So it looks like you can make bands bigger uh, to draw more attention to them. Now, we don't have time to go into much more details on the eye tracking right now. Uh, we're doing a session fully on eye tracking on Thursday. That's tomorrow, it's Wednesday today, is it? It's Wednesday, yeah. So tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, you can come and see much more details about the eye tracking experiments that Amy's been doing in the research team. And believe me, we're just on the start of the path of this. You know, we're making new discoveries that we're, we're making recommendations from, but then we're actually generating more questions for using eye tracking in dashboards. You know, any eye tracking research that's been done already is based on text on screens. It doesn't apply to how people look at data. So it's really exciting to see the research team doing this. Uh, and you can all partake in an experiment uh, and sit down and go through one of our latest studies and help us. So please check out the labs. Go talk to Amy, the researcher in, in charge of this, and help us understand more about how you consume dashboards. So that's uh, tomorrow morning, uh, th Thursday for the repeat of the session, and all week go to the labs. All right, so bands, they're awesome. I love bands. I didn't even, we didn't really consider them before we started the book, but now we think they're great. So we recommend you use those. And with that, it's Steve. Thank you, Andy. For number five. So you mentioned things that you didn't consider before you started working on the book. And, and, and I would have said, big ass numbers, nah, you're not, that's not a visualization. You're trying to create charts and realize, no, these could be really helpful. The other thing is, in the same way that Jeff said that like, the number one mistake people make is um, the misuse of color, the thing that I have found on working on the book and working with these two gentlemen, but also the incredibly wonderful people who submitted dashboards, we have 28 different scenarios in the book and a dashboard that says if you have this particular business predicament, we think this would work for you. Um, the need for collaboration. And people you know, also ask me about, well, how did the three of us work on this thing? You know, you know, how do three people author a single book? Don't you want to have a single unified voice? And didn't you have fights, disagreements, arguments? Yes, we certainly had debates and arguments. I wouldn't say we ever had fights, but they were wonderful debates. But one reason the thing worked was it's not like a band that breaks up because of artistic differences. None of us were trying to create art. We were trying to create clarity. I'm not saying we didn't want dashboards that look great. Of course we wanted dashboards that look great. But the number one thing, besides finding collaborators and iterating, 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 I'm going to take you through examples of that, was that we had one common goal. And we each have a slightly different way of articulating it. This is the way that I like to put it, which is for the largest number of people in your audience, I mean, the people have your stakeholders, don't mean the whole world. For the largest number of people, you want to provide the greatest degree of understanding with the least amount of effort. Always ask yourself that. Creating a dashboard visualization, am I showing off, you know, making cool stuff, or am I allowing people to understand what's going on with the least amount of effort? So let me walk you through the importance of having collaborators, someone that will give you feedback, a little pushback on stuff, tell you when you're full of crap, saying that's not as clear as you think it is. Here's the scenario. 
I had a student that attended one of my Tableau training classes and said, hey, I don't know how to do this. We're trying to show um, churn in our organization. In this case, it was subscriber churn. How many people come in each month and how many people decide not to renew their subscriptions? So you can see I've got the data for each month for these different divisions and I've got 70 people coming in and we lost zero. And now we got 80 people coming in but 90 left. We got 100 people coming in, et cetera. There was also one other requirement. They said, whatever chart we have, we also need to show all the numbers. How many of you have that requirement, by the way? You know, that, hey, I gotta see the actual numbers. Okay, that happens all the time. We'll talk about that. I'll give you the gateway drug to data visualization in a minute. Um, this was my first attempt to show churn. The gray bars are, hey, people coming in, and then the red bars are people leaving, and then you head over to the next month, and here's how many came in, and he here's how many left. Okay, I'm, I'm not saying this is great. One of the beauties of Tableau is you try stuff, and then if that doesn't work, you try something else. Here is a collage of the 30 different iterations I went through in trying to do this. Now, most of them are bar charts, and, and I'm sure you're looking at the thing in the upper right-hand corner and going, okay, what's that thing on the right? You know, because it's the only thing that looks different. It, it was an attempt, you know, let me walk through it, because for a while, this was a contender. You know, this area chart, this mountain chart, where the, um, the gray is, hey, here's how many people came in this period, and the, um, uh, the red is, here's how many people left. Now, it, it was a big source of confusion for people because you're used to, oh, if the numbers go up, that means gains, but the losses, they're going up. Yeah, and and what, what I'm trying to show is I'm superimposing the losses over that. And, and, and then you've got the dual axis chart going on, but the thing that eventually killed it was someone said, you know, I look at this thing and it looks like guys around a fire in hoods. And I went, and now, now it's, the only thing, <laughs> it's the only thing I see, and I am not gonna be responsible for creating the KKK chart. So we, <laughs> this, is, this is not gonna be what I suggest we do. I thought this was the winner. I thought, hey, I got this, you know, this makes sense. Here's how many coming in, here's how many going out. I had Andy look at it, and he said, man, I'm finding this confusing. Even with me explaining how it works, I'm finding this thing confusing. And, and I'm glad he kind of gave me pushback on this. You know, and said, all right, let me see if I can do better. One of the problems is, this is something Tableau doesn't do well, which is a paired or clustered bar chart. You know, oddly enough, Excel does it great. And most of the times, there are better ways to do it. But um, uh, eventually, this is the thing that won the day. This was the thing that would allow the um, largest number of people to get the greatest degree of understanding with the least amount of effort. And, and it required doing the uh, uh, clustered bar chart. And a funny thing, Jonathan Drummy, Zen master, said, hey man, how did you get the, the bars to be next to each other? And I just kind of looked at him and said, your blog post explaining how to do this? <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> oh, let's go back to that requirement, okay? Which was um, the, um, hey, we gotta show all the numbers. So I had these wonderful charts and I said, hey, here are all the numbers. Jeff looked at this and went, man, I'm kind of not buying this, which is Jeff's way of saying, I hate that. Um, very calm guy. Um, and I realized, oh my God, he's right. If I had a student, if I had a, 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 any of my clients, my colleagues, I would say, why don't you just have a table full of numbers? Use the gateway drug to data visualization, which is the highlight table. And look, you got all the numbers, you got the requirement, but I've got them color coded. Oh, what a great idea. And here is the final version of the dashboard, which I never would have been able to make had I not had feedback from stakeholders, feedback from these two guys. Uh, there is one thing, though, which is if I could change one thing. Okay, I am, in fact, proud to have written uh, the big book of dashboards, but an even more formidable accomplishment is I've actually read the big book of dashboards. And realizing, oh, man, the big-ass numbers are really useful. I would add them now. I would put the, those big ass numbers up at the top and have, hey, here are the gains, here are the losses, here's the net uh, best month, worst month. They kind of you know, create context that, that explains the rest of the chart. A few other things. Um, this, fervent debates amongst the three of us. By the way, you know what this is? These are the speaker ratings from 2015. And it allows each speaker to type in his or her ID and say, here is how you did compared to everybody else. I love this way of showing um, 
an individual's performance versus peers. It's my go-to way. I've seen it change people's behavior. And whomever speaker 323 is, it's not me, or it wasn't me, or it wasn't I, for the grammarians here. Um, whomever that person is, they did a great job. Look how good that dot is compared to the other dots. Andy said, why are you showing it this way? You know, there's a perfectly fine way to do this, which is a box and whisker pot. And Andy discovered, I hate box and whisker pots. Okay? That's me. If I had an audience of statisticians that are used to looking at this type of thing, it would be an insult to them not to include this type of chart. Further discussions with Jeff, um, and I made another alternative, which is, okay, this is called a unit histogram. And it's attempting to show here's your dot, and I'm gonna show you if your dot is large, it means a lot of people reviewed your session. By the way, with your help, you could make me a big dot way at the top. So I hope, <laughs> <laughs> I hope you will do that. Um, one more thing you know, about something which, man, had Andy not g given me pushback on something, something important, many important things would have been left out of the book, but this one would have kept me up at night. I knew we had to include something about this. It happens, this is such a common thing. How do I show year to date this year compared with year to date last year? You know, how are we doing? And here's a dashboard that shows this. The top chart's really easy. The bars are this year. The vertical line are last year. And then I have a running sum over time. And Andy said, well, is that the most important thing? Or should I be showing the difference, not the actuals or the difference? So he said, why aren't you showing this? And I realized he's right. So if you look in the upper right-hand corner, oh wait, hold on, I can do this as well. There we go, upper right-hand corner. You see that there's a toggle. I can show actual versus year over year. And the, and the book would have gone to print and we would have left something out. So you need to have that. There should be lots of debates. So where do you find your collaborators? You know, I was fortunate enough to find these two people Tapped, asked Jeff to do it, and Jeff and I managed to bribe and blackmail Andy into doing it. Uh, where do you find pl collaborators? Well, this, this room is a pretty good place to, to, to start. Tableau user groups is a great place. Tableau public, look at the great work people are making and sharing freely. It's unbelievable. Blog posts, and when you find somebody whose work you like, send them an email, send them a letter, call them up, say thank you and ask them, hey, I'm working on something, would you mind looking at it? And my guess is they will absolutely say yes. So that's how you can find collaborators. And if you're very fortunate, you will find two people as capable of, uh, that I was able to have. And with that, let me pass this over to Andy to take us home. Thank you, Steve. I, I honestly can't reiterate that enough. We, the, we used uh, Slack and WebEx to have, we're all based in different places. The conversations we had were just so intense, right? And that, you know, we, we had that opportunity by generating a book, but you all have that opportunity to find people here, work with colleagues, and just talk this through, stuff through. Don't operate in a vacuum. It just makes a massive difference. So I'm gonna show you the last example and slightly re return back to where we started from. It's slightly similar to the collaboration thing. You can't operate in a vacuum. You should steal like an artist. Uh, what I actually didn't say at the start is the book is, is, is organized. It's 27 different dashboard case studies. Uh, in fact, are there any, how many people are in the room who's got a dashboard in the book? Right. I can see a few hands. So some of the people here, we used their dashboards. We didn't use many of our own dashboards. So I'd like to thank everybody in the room for your contributions. You, know, you made a big difference. But the point is, you can steal like an artist from any kind of industry. And that's why we try to gather dashboards from many different places. This is one of my favorites. This is from Andy Kirk of Visualizing Data. And it's a dashboard for sports players in an English Premier League. Each Monday after a match, before training, they get this sent to their iPhone or mobile device. And it shows for each category uh, how well they did. So you can see total distance, high run distance, and various other measures. The yellow dot shows that match. The red dots show the five previous matches. So you're sharing recent to near recent. And then the gray dots show the rest of the season, maybe stuff that's less relevant. And what you can see on the top is total distance. This player was OK. Well, it was not very good in, in the most recent match, uh, but was kind of average for the high run distance. Right Now, this is an awesome dashboard. It allows the players to 
talk amongst each other, have a bit of gamification, uh, and compare measures. But what you can do with any dashboard you see, not just in our book, anywhere, is abstract these things and think, well, what's actually going on? Because here this is a metric about player, players' performance in a match, but actually it's just a category with one dimension comparing against others. And whether you're in HR or health or manufacturing, you are doing that. You are comparing one thing from another. And what we found is that mix of dashboards is really interesting. So obviously in the book, we've got uh, a bunch of chapters, but you can get this inspiration from anywhere. Tableau Public, steal like an artist. We looked at this uh, dashboard earlier, and one of the reasons this dashboard, Steve had such a great time advising on this dashboard, is that this one, this was like the last chapter added to the book. This dashboard didn't exist before we started collaborating and thinking and stealing like artists. It was only after we'd written a whole bunch of chapters, so got this experience under our belt, that Steve took this dashboard or worked with a client. This was our original dashboard. Now, it's not a bad dashboard. The information's all there, but the highlights and the headlines don't pop out. And by working with the client, Steve was able to help them get to this solution, which has the big-ass numbers uh, and summarizes the information in a much better way, a much clearer way, and in a much compelling way. So we were stealing like an artist from our own book and from other, other sources and scenarios. And that's, you know, that's just such a, an incredible recommendation. As uh, users of Tableau, you have access to uh, Tableau Public and Makeover Monday and collaborative projects where there are just thousands and thousands of examples that you can take inspiration from. Uh, our, our own dashboard has 28 different scenarios, but literally steal like an artist from wherever you see that information or see information you like that is effective. I think one of the com most compelling things, uh, or one of the most rewarding things for me, is Steve and Jeff, have been seeing people take some of our ideas and then emulate them uh, in their own work. It's absolutely fantastic. So that Steal Like an Artist was kind of the inspiration for this book. And uh, you know, you, sure, it would be awesome if you bought a copy. That's great. But there are a massive multitude of places you can go and great, get great sources of dashboards for yourself. So Steal Like an Artist. So with that, we kind of come to the end. Uh, let me just uh, go to one, one here. These are our six recommendations. Design to a grid to help people see the data very clearly. Avoid clutter. To, don't throw everything on there. It's not, you're not throwing on the kitchen sink. Use color, fonts correctly, and bands, but collaborate and steal like an artist. We, I mean, we, we, it's, it's been an incredible experience writing this book, right? Uh, you know, and I think this whole collaboration thing, it's just, it was just amazing writing a book, going through that. If you think you have a book in you, I highly recommend you do it. You know, there's a great opportunity for many more books in this field, so I highly recommend you do it. Um, I'll show you those six lessons again in a moment. We're very proud of the screaming cat. This was drawn by a cartoonist. Uh, this is the icon for bad dashboards or bad examples in our book. We've got badges and stickers here, but what I implore for all of you is to try and avoid situations where you create a, a screaming cat. These are our six recommendations. Uh, we're not going to do live Q&A, but please come and ask us questions. We're really happy to talk to you. Uh, and just take this. Design to a grid. Avoid clutter. Use color wisely. Get those bands on the top. Collaborate and steal like an artist. Oh. 11 of the 28 dashboards are available to be downloaded in Tableau format from bigbookofdashboards.com. And there'll probably be more there. You can sign up for a mailing list, but, but um, they're not all done in Tableau, and we couldn't. A lot of them have proprietary data, but 11 of the 28 are at yeah. that website. Yeah, so please go download those. Let us know what you think. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you very much. Please fill out the survey and have a wonderful rest of the conference. Thank you.